to, uh, to share because I know what's coming, okay? And we'll talk about that in just a moment. W- would you pray with me, okay? <clears throat> Father, we, we sing about what you've done for us, and sometimes we sing to you about who you are. Lord, we know that we are deeply, richly loved by you. Lord, we want to return that love. Lord, as your word says, we love because we've first been loved by you. Father, this morning, Lord, we would just ask that you would, you would uh, just stir in our own hearts Give us a vision for people, Lord, who don't know you. Give us a heart for the lost. You came, what you came to seek for and what you came to save. Give us that same heart. And Lord, give us those opportunities. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I got two questions just to get us started this morning that I want to ask you, just to make us think about this for a moment. <clears throat> We're each going to have to personalize this, okay? By the way, I don't know what's wrong with my voice. I feel good, but it still sounds weird to me. Does it sound a little strange to you? Good, good. Doesn't sound a little? Somebody, okay. I don't know. It just sounds off to me. Um, <clears throat> but... Here's the first question. When, when, when was the last time that you led someone to Jesus Christ? To faith, to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. When was the last time? I'm going to give you a chance to calculate that in your mind. So just you got about 30 seconds to think back. Was it three weeks ago, three years ago, a decade? Have I ever? When was the last time you allow God to use you to lead someone to Jesus Christ? Second question It's an easier question, okay, than the first one. When was the last time that you invited somebody to church? Let you think on that one just a second. Some of us might say, hey, it was last week. Awesome. Have you ever let or invited somebody to church? Have you invited, but they didn't come? There's a difference, by the way, between inviting and bringing. I just want you to think about that. Y'all are quiet. Man, okay, stirred you up here. Um, like for you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, I didn't see that up there, Okay. <clears throat> That's good. No, you can back up. Uh, no, you can, you can leave it there. You're good. You're good. Yeah, leave it for the next one. Okay, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Okay, now we're going to do this together. We did this last week. Noah's little technique, I really like it. I'm going to use it more often and more often. But let's, let's uh, what you see in yellow, go ahead and put it up there for me. What you see in yellow, you will say, I'll, I'll do the what's in white, okay? Here we go. Therefore, if any man, will say and woman, if anyone is in Christ, he is a? The? Passed away. Behold, have come. All right. Man, how many of you have heard this verse before? You've read it on your own, right? You've done that before. You think you know it, right? 
Do you know what this verse means? If you stop for a minute, we can quote the verse we've heard. If I say, therefore, if any man is in Christ, a lot of us would have gone, uh, is a new creature, right? The old things have passed away, new things have come. Or, you, or whatever version you have in it. It's kind of one of those you've, you've tucked away in your memory bank somewhere. But first thing that I want to tell you is it opens with a what? What word there? Therefore. So it's a summation of what's preceded. So the chapter or two before is laying this really powerful foundation, and now he comes along and he just makes this really grandiose statement. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Some versions say a new creation. A new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, I want you to stop and just dwell on this for just a minute. Anyone who's in Christ has become a new creature. Anyone who's not in Christ is what? An old creature. How many of you want to stand up before you today? The older we get, I think I feel like I'm an old creature. No, you're not. We're talking about the soul and not the body, okay? Every one of us, if we're just talking about the body, is an aging creature. But if we're talking about the soul, we're talking about something very, very different, aren't we? If we're talking about that spiritual life that we can have in Christ, to be in Christ, and that's the key word. What does it mean to be in Christ? It means to at least to belong to him. It means that our life has been immersed into his life or his life is in our life. We know via the spirit of God who comes to dwell within us. But that's a favorite phrase of Paul's. He, he, you can't read Romans without him giving it to you up to a jillion times. You can't read Galatians. You can't read any of these places. He's going to talk about being in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. That's a saving word, in Christ. It's a transformative word or phrase. That's more than a word, isn't it? It's, an, it's, an, it's a transformative phrase, to be in Christ. I love that because we can be in something else, can't we? And it's that something else that, that brings us back to that old creature that maybe we once were. Old things come from what? The old creature. New things come from from being a new creature in Christ. So, so those two phrases, new creatures and new things, we need, to, we need to revisit that. We need to be familiar again with what that means, to be a new creature and to be, and, and what are those new things? What are those new things that have come in and through our lives because we are new creatures. And we're new creatures because we're in Christ. Here's one of the sad realities that I think that maybe sometimes we can relate to. And I don't know that Paul intended for us to relate to it like this, but here it is. Um, first of all, the positive, old things have passed away. If we're in Christ, if we're new creatures, the old things have passed away. That belongs to the old creature that I once were, that you once were. The old things belong to that old creature, to that old era. New things are what belongs to the new era or becoming a new creature in Christ. But here's one of the things that I think happens if we're not careful. And that is, is that new things sometimes seem to have passed away. Do you remember a time when, when you, you clearly were not in Christ, you've, been, you've come to realize that Jesus Christ is everything you want your life to be, and, and now, you're, you've become a Christian, 
you become a believer in Jesus Christ. You've had this spiritual beginning, this spiritual transformation, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you begin, you just, it's like an onslaught of new things. Okay, man, that's, that right there, that's an old thing. He says, that's done away, that's past. I get rid of that old thing, get rid of that old thing, get rid of that old thing. Many of these things are, are issues of the heart, aren't they? They're, they're sin, they're, they're ways of thinking, they're, they're, there's all kinds of junk, and he just starts sifting through all that stuff, and it's like, we're taking out the trash, we're taking out the trash, we're taking out the garbage, Old things go. Why? Because I'm a new creature. It just doesn't fit me anymore. I'm a new creature. I'm not an old creature. I'm a new creature. And so we're getting rid of all of this stuff. And, but some, somewhere down the road in this journey of following Jesus, what happens? New things that we once were so familiar with that were characteristic of being a new creature in Christ seem like those things start passing away. And it seems like old things have come back. I can't find that in the Bible, <laughs> okay? This is what I find in the Bible. But I think that if we don't nurture what it means to be in Christ, like a dog returns to its vomit or a sow that wallows in the mire. I used to raise pigs in FFA. You know, you know why they do that? They don't have sweat glands. So they, they like to get down in that muddy, that's how they cool themselves. But boy does it stink because it's not just mud in there. There's some other stuff excrement. So a dog returns to its vomit. You've seen it. They go right there. They throw up and they go eat it 30 minutes later. We got rid of it. I threw it up. It's gone. It's an old thing. It's not a part of my life anymore. But I go back like a dog and I eat that stuff back into me. Old stuff that I Long past. I don't think the new things are over just in our, in our new beginning with Jesus Christ. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a process of more new and more new and more new. And it's not like, well, I'm just dragging the old with me. No, no, no. God, God helps us jettison all that stuff way back when. And now... 10 years into the journey or 15 years into the journey, I ought not be still dragging that stuff. What, what, is, what are the, quote, new old things that we're getting rid of so that God can, can bring new things, keep coming? So there is, this, there is this that I want to remind us this morning, okay? What, what Jesus has is, is doing with us if we are in Christ. And if you feel like, my gosh, I'm looking at my life right now and it still feels like there's a lot of that, a lot of that stuff in me and I, I feel like just going and, and, and jumping in a, a pig pen and just wallow around in that stuff again. Man, don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't do it. Let, let, let's, let's move on here for a minute because I, I want you to see that we could stop right here. Well, let back up again. Sorry, sorry. Thank you for being right with me though. Um, we could stop and think that's all there is to this verse. And we could go back into the preceding verses and see even more that's going on there that helps inform upon what he means by being a new creature and the new things that are gonna come. But he very quickly begins to tell us what those new things are, and that's what we wanna move forward to the very next verse, thank you. <clears throat> so, let's read this one together. Verse 18, now all are from God, who to himself through Christ and gave us the 
Okay, good. So what is that all about? Now, all these things, what things? What things are from God? What? There it is. Thank you. New things. All, now, he's just said new things are going to come in your life. And so the very next verse says, now, where do these things come from? They come from God who, did, who has done two things. And I'm going to tell you, here's the new things that he wants us to get our, our focus on. The first one is that you and I, if you're in Christ, you've been reconciled to God. Reconciled to God. What does that mean? What does reconciliation mean? What's that? Brought back. Brought back. Okay, yes. Brought back. So, so I need two volunteers, one from over here and one from over here. Real quick, you can run up here. Yeah, all right, all right, here we go. Okay, all right, that, that works. Oh my gosh, a cat fight. That's what we're getting ready to have right here. Okay, so, so here's the deal. Before there's reconciliation, you guys are enemies. Okay, so here we go. Cat fight. Okay, okay, yeah. So, so you're enemies. Now you're separated. You're, you've fought and whatever. Rec- to be reconciled means you're no longer enemies, but you are what? Friends. Friends. There we go. All right. That is what, yeah, yeah let's give him a big hand. That's, that's great. Okay, you can sit down. That is what God, or, or what Jesus is doing with us, or God is doing with us through Christ, is reconciling us to the Father. Our life the old creature that we was, that we were, was an enemy of God, okay? Was an enemy of God, but now we are friends of God. He has reconciled us. We had, we had all, this, um, all this stuff, so, um, let, well, well, we'll come back and look at, we'll, we'll look at some of the things that he's reconciled us from in just a minute. Actually, throw the next verse up. There it is. Namely, God was in Christ, the work that Jesus did at the cross, reconciling the world to himself. How? Not counting their trespasses against them. I'm sorry, I was supposed to let y'all read, wasn't I? And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We'll come back and look at that here again in just a second. So, what is he doing? He's reconciling our sins, our trespasses, are the, thing, the rocks that we're throwing at God. No, God, I don't want that. No, I don't want to live that way. No, my heart is for me. My life is for me. And so we fight, right? Like the little cat fight we saw there a minute ago. Now they're friends. Now God has reconciled us to him and we are friends of God. An amazing thing. It seems like half the songs that they're writing today are kind of along that lines, aren't they? Just how, how much God loves us, and it's a love relationship. There's a, there's a lot of that in our, in our worship songs these days. We're friends we're to be reconciled to God. We're not resisting. We're not fighting. We're surrendering. We're submitting. We're following. We're doing what he wants to do. There's obedience. There's all of these other things. So the first thing that becomes new when he reconciles us is, is so transformative that in Christ means that we become a new creature. And that's the first really big new thing that happens, a new creature. But there's a second thing that happens that's new, that comes into our life. And it comes attached with being reconciled to him. You know what it is? Hint, hint, it's in that verse. He's given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He reconciled us to his heavenly father, our God, and at the same time gave us, he brought us to the father, and at the same time he says, here, here's a ministry now you're gonna take. You are my, my ones that I'm sending out to to do with this ministry of reconciliation. You're gonna go and help others do the same thing that you've just experienced. 
It's not for just a, a few. It's part of the new that maybe we didn't embrace. Okay? Maybe we thought it's great to be forgiven. It's great to experience wonderful fuzzies with God. It's great, all these other things. But what about this other part? It's great to be used by him in this ministry of reconciliation. Every single person that's been reconciled to God has also been given the ministry of reconciliation. He said, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Don't need it. I'm not really that, you know, people person. Don't have to be. It's the Jesus that's in you. It's the ministry that you've been given. You've, you know this God. That person does not. And you know that person. You can do it, man. I'm telling you, you can do it. Every one of us can do it if we are in Christ. It's one of the new things that he's trying to, trying to shove down. Now, you threw up that, that old stuff, and he's trying to feed us this new stuff. And here it is, ministry of reconciliation. What does he mean by the word of reconciliation? What's the difference? The, the word is what? It's Jesus. Yeah, it is Jesus. Absolutely. What did I? Living to? Salvation. Yes. It's, it's the gospel. The gospel is the word that, that we, we take Okay, it's the gospel of salvation, it's the gospel of the kingdom, it's the gospel of love, all of those things work, okay? But that's what he means when he says the word of reconciliation. He's saying, you and I, we know this word. Have you been reconciled to Christ? If you have, you know the gospel. I, I don't know how articulate you are with sharing it, but that's okay, because you've experienced it. And you've experienced a father. You were an enemy, now you're a friend. You were distant, now you're close to him. You were an old creature, now you're a new creature. And what does it mean to be a new creature? It means that you and I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. All right, the reconciled, guys, become the reconcilers. Okay, let's move to the next one. This is the very next verse. Therefore, therefore, since we're new in Christ, since new things have come, since we've been reconciled and given the ministry of reconciliation, therefore we are as though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God too. That's, that's, who we are, guys, we are called, each one of us, to be ambassadors for God. What's an ambassador? A representative of, of one land, you know, a government, kingdom, to another. Goes and represents, you know. And so, so what do you call Somebody who goes to another country to represent themselves. A tourist. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> See, the question we have to ask ourselves is, who am I representing now since I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus? Since new things have come into my life, since I've been reconciled, he gave me the ministry of reconciliation. I don't want to pull that ministry of reconciliation thing out. I don't, I don't really, I'm not comfortable sharing the word, the gospel of reconciliation. No, 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 no. We, we, we just want to keep that kind of packed away somewhere, right? You know, but no, no. What have we, if that has happened to us, we are automatically ambassadors. And here's the thing that we can be highly tempted to do. And that is that, that you and I can we, can, either, we can either go through life just touring through all the things in the world. We can just tour it. Or we can go as ambassadors, 
called, empowered, given this ministry. And guys, I'm gonna tell you, I believe that it's way easier than we make it out to be. We, we're, we're like, again, it's like, I, man, I, I've never done this. I've never done it successfully. Uh, it was embarrassing. It's like, I, again, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big talker. I'm an introvert. I'm what, there's nothing in here. I've not found any place in here where extroverts and introverts and, and anything else are excluded or included in any of this. We're all called to represent our God who has reconciled us. And at this moment he reconciled us, not, not 10 years later, not after you've gone to Bible college and learned how, not after you've gone through a course, or no, it's automatic. Let me, just, let me just ask a, a raise of hands. How many of you, when you first became a believer in Jesus Christ, um, you, were, you were reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you immediately started running around and sharing with friends and people and, and stuff like that. Let me just see, okay. Okay, some of you, did anybody train you immediately? No. You might tell you, yeah, no, 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 okay. That's about maybe a third of us, okay. So I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna suggest to you that it's, it's supposed to be automatic, okay. It's not something that you wait for until you get really good at it because you know what? None of us ever will. None of us will be fantastic at it, there's, there, that we can train, yes, we can do all that kind of stuff. It happens automatically, and I, w- I want you to see kind of why this is important. But, but, oh, I got one more participatory thing for us, okay? I want us to say it so that we have confessed it and professed it, okay? Three, three things we're gonna say. I have been reconciled to God through Christ. Let's say it. I have been reconciled to God through Christ. The second thing that we want to say is, I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. I have been given the ministry of reconciliation. The third thing that we want to say is, I am an ambassador of Christ. I am an ambassador of Christ. Look what that ambassador does. Can we back it up to where? There we are. The ambassador of Christ. As though God were entreating through us. What does that mean, to entreat? That means we're out there going, man, pleading with people. Man, you need to know this Jesus that I know. Let me just tell you my story, my testimony. Yeah, I'm not real wordy. I'm not all that kind of, but let me tell you how it worked for me. Yeah, we're out, but we're begging on behalf of Christ for people to be reconciled to God. It doesn't say anything about how good we are. It just says that's what we are. We're, we're out there essentially begging, please, please don't ruin your life. Please don't destroy your life. Please come to know my Jesus. You're, uh, you don't have to tell them they're an enemy. Maybe somewhere along the way in their repentance, you want to help them see you really are kind of a, you know, a dog or whatever. But, but he loves you and he wants to be your friend. All those sorts of things. I don't care. It, it's not a program. It's not a canned approach. It's just letting that living experience of being reconciled to him just automatically positions each of us to be able to do this thing, if we will, if we'll do it, because it's a package deal. Okay, now let's come to, what do we got there next? <clears throat> so here's the thing that I want you to know. So you go, where do I get started? Where do I get started? That's a good question. How many of you had that question? Oh, you didn't? I was, hoping, I was hoping we would have that question. Okay, I get it. I'm in. I get it. I'm an ambassador. I haven't been doing my, you know, I, I left the, uh, what, what do you call the places where ambassadors go to other countries? Embassies. I left the embassy, hadn't been there 
I've been in the homeland for all this time. I thought we sent you out to be in there, but yeah, but I came, uh, you know, no. And, and we go, so how do I get started on this thing? Here it is. Each one of us have a sphere of influence that's different from everybody else. Absolutely different from everybody else. Paul mentions this. There's a whole lot of stuff going on in this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and 11 that I'm not going to get into. But he mentions in this, this, this issue of a sphere of influence. And he's talking to the, to the Corinthians because Paul has labored there with the gospel. And, and he's saying, we will not boast beyond limits, but we will boast only with res- regard or respect to the sphere of influence that God has assigned to us. Okay? Uh, to reach even to you. So he, he acknowledges, hey, God has assigned this area to me. Now, it is kind of geographical, but it's also personal. But he's, he's acknowledging that there's a sphere of influence. Then he says this, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Now let's go to the next verse. Okay. We do not boast beyond the limit in the labors of others. Well, all he's saying is, hey, I'm not talking about what these Christians have done or this church has done or whatever. Wherever they've labored with the gospel and God's kingdom is going, I'm not even, I'm not trying to, to, to take claim of any of that. I'm just speaking for, for the labor that I've done with y'all, okay? But our hope is that your faith increases, our sphere of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. So he's saying, I have a, a sphere of influence among you. I want it to enlarge so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another sphere of influence. Okay, enough of that. Now, here's what I want to show you. Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Every one of us has a sphere of influence. Can y'all see that? What is that? A stick man. I am good at making stick people. I can make lady stick people. Okay, and that's what we'll do. We'll make a lady stick person. All right, so if this is you, this is you, okay, you have a sphere of influence that nobody else has. These are people that, I better make some ladies have there, with arms. Okay. Yeah. Okay. These people that you know, and there's three primary categories of people that you know. They are family, friends, and Huh? Enemies. <laughs> well, we'll, so we'll use a, a word to capture a lot of associates. Associates can be neighbors. It can be fellow workers where you go to work with. If you're in school, there are people you sit next to. But you have three categories of people that are within your sphere of influence. Family, friends, and associates, Okay. Those people are what the New Testament would call your oikos. There's a Greek word, and we're not going to spend any time. I was going to look at a whole bunch of verses, but I don't want to go there. I'm just going to throw it at you. Oikos is translated household. But in, in the biblical times, the Greek and Roman understanding of oikos extended beyond your immediate family. 
It included your extended family. It included close friends. It included maybe fellows uh, or, or servants that worked or, or, or some of those. So, so you have an oikos or you have a sphere of influence. Now, here's the deal. Somebody else, this person right here is a friend of yours, okay? But, but you, this person knows a whole bunch of people, don't they? Okay, knows a whole bunch of people that you don't know these people. They are not in your sphere of influence, but they're in her sphere of influence, right? So, so here's, here's the thing. What you want to be able to do is your focus, your primary mission field, if this is you, is here, 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 and here. Okay? That's the people that you're able to most easily reach. I would, I, if we had time to go through the book of Acts, I could show you that that was actually in the thinking strategically of reaching the, the known world at that time. They were going after families, oikoses, those networks of relationships. Now, what happens, guys, what happens if you reach this person right here? They become reconciled to God, and they are also given the ministry of reconciliation, aren't they? They become an immediate ambassador for Christ. Now, you've got a larger, you can enlarge your mission field or your sphere of influence. That's an extension of your sphere, but you want to help them reach their sphere before they get so Christianized that they don't have any more lost friends, right? Isn't it sad we get Christianized? Okay, let's go, let's go back to the next verse. Or not verse, but the, uh, uh, I've got a little chart. There we go. Okay, here's, this is, statist, this is statistics, okay? Who reaches who? Remember the question we asked, when was the last time you led somebody to Christ or you brought somebody to church? That's what this thing's all about. How are people influenced to receive Jesus or attend church? This is statistics that have been done. It's done every few years over and over and the stats remain virtually the same. I've been watching this for 30 years has not changed, okay? Let's see the first one. So, if the pastor or church staff initiate leading somebody to Christ or bringing them to church, the people that that is successful with is anywhere from zero to 3%. How effective are we gonna be reaching this world if we base it on that? Not very good. Let's move on to the next one. Visitation, you got some kind of visitation program. We go out and visit people house to house. You visit the church, here's whatever. A half to 1% come to faith through Christ. And some churches have great visitation programs. That doesn't mean that it's wrong to do it. I'm just saying that's, that's the percentages of people that come to Christ or to church because of it. Let's see the next one. Small group activity. You got, you got a small group, meets at church, meets in a home, meets at a coffee shop, doesn't matter where it meets, it can be whatever kind of group it is, four to six percent. Four to six percent because they hear about your group or whatever. Now there's something that can kick that up a little bit. Church programs, let's look at that. Two to four percent, hey, you got a great thing at this church, uh, not AA, Celebrate Recovery, <laughs> thank you. Celebrate recovery or whatever else. Two to four percent. Keep going. Thank you, please. Benevolent efforts and special needs. One to three percent. Next. Uninvited visits. They just drove by your place, saw it or saw you online and decided to come check it out. Two to four percent. Next. Special services and big events. Crusades. Do you know how much, I was looking at the most recent statistics 
on the effects of, sal uh, of, of television, radio, and crusade type things? 0.001%. But, and yet, there'll still be hundreds of thousands of people, that, but when you start looking at billions, okay, so big events. Friends, relatives, associates, 75 to 90%. That statistic has held strong for as long as I've been a Christian. What does that tell us? That tells us that we all have to be a Bud Miller, who I love dearly, great friend, who seems to be able to know everybody he's ever met and keeps up with everybody perfectly and their kids and their dogs and, and everything. It just, he can reach and reach and reach. He's Stretch Armstrong, get his arms around anybody. So maybe if we just had a few people that could know everybody in the world and be their friend and be spiritual family and on and on and so forth, that we could get it done with a few. Is that what that statistic tells us? No, no. <laughs> that's right, no. What it tells us is that if we understand rightly that you and I have been called to be an ambassador of Christ, that you and I are truly not only reconciled to him, but we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, that if we start acting upon that, Oh, that, okay, never mind. Yeah, if we start acting upon that, then we can reach that 75 to 90%. When we, when we are all in the game, so to speak, when we're, when we're all not just touring life, but we're ambassadors, we're representing our God. And, and what's neat is we can just do it with family and friends and associates, but we, there has to be an intentionality. That's the thing. When do we get intentional about it? Well, I've tried with this person. Again, there's, a, there's a lot of other things that go into it, like prayer. Like, you know, maybe going out to dinner with, doing activities together, uh, looking for opportunities, taking the risk. Here's a time that I'm gonna speak into their life. A gift, a book, I don't care what it is, but, but as we start doing that, and the second thing is, is inviting them to a place where God's alive and at work. And I do believe that one of the things that the church is when it gathers, remember we talked about that, we gather and we scatter, we gather and we scatter. When we scatter, we're out there reaching all these people, and when we gather, many times we're trying to bring them back so they can experience. So, so here's... Here's the thing, here's the opportunity that you and I have right now before us. What is it? Bringer, Easter, Easter. Bringers, inviters and bringers. Easter is coming. Easter got squashed the last two years, didn't it? Because of COVID. And so we've been preparing Behind the scenes, we've been working on getting ready to, to try to encourage us as a body to, to be ambassadors who go out and invite people and bring them. Now, when I use the word invite and bring, can y'all look at me just for a second? When I use the word invite and bring, that can mean different things to different ones of us. At the simplest level, for the person that has not experienced a lot of like, man, I really know how to share the gospel with this person. It can be as simple as inviting somebody that you know, a family member, a friend, somebody at work, an associate somewhere, and just, and just inviting them. And then praying for them through the week that God will bring them. And then give them a reminder call and say, hey, why don't you go with us? We're going to have lunch afterwards. We'd love to have you over for lunch. Be sly, be tricky. No, I'm, <laughs> that's not sly or tricky. That's just being real. You know, it's like, do you, you want to go the extra mile? I say, hey, we're, we're going to have you over for lunch. But whatever the, the, your goal is, you're not just trying to shoehorn them into some canned deal. You, you got to be a friend, okay? So, 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 you know, work at being a friend there. But, um, 
So for some, inviting and bringing is just simply means I- I'm going to work at that. For others, inviting and bringing is like, hey, I am, I've been talking to them about the Lord for a while. They know the gospel. They're not there yet, but we keep working at it and working at it. But hey, I'm going to also invite them and bring them to this special service on and on and so forth, or, or to a small group that I'm meeting in, other things. So it's the, it, you know, there, there are levels of what that means to invite and bring. I just, I, I want you to understand it's more than just simply invite and bring, but I don't want those who are like, I don't think I can do all the other stuff yet. You will if you just start practicing inviting and bringing, and then you see how God works in all that, and you get opportunities. They come to church, and then they want, they got questions about that thing they heard or that thing they saw or experienced. Now, you get an opportunity to speak into that. Well, let me tell you what that means, or, or, or whatever. It just helps. We're working together in that way. Okay, in just a moment. So we're, we're, here, at the, we're here, here at the end of this. What is this Easter service going to look like? We, 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 what's that? Eggy? Eggs? Yeah, we're going to pummet them with eggs. Now, there is an egg, there is, there is a, uh, a Easter egg hunt the Wednesday night before Easter, uh, Easter Sunday. But um, we're, we've got these packets we're going to give out here in just a minute. It's got four cards. And it says on the front of the card, what's your story? What is your story? And so we've titled this The Third Story. And I just want you to know where we're going with this so that you know how to, how to, how to prepare and hopefully God will use you to, to invite and bring somebody, okay? But what we're gonna do, it's gonna be an evangelistic service. We're gonna um, uh, tag team preaching through it and there'll be three main points, Okay. The first point, the first point is you will never understand the third story without understanding the first story and the second story. So what is the first story? The first story is our story. It's the story of the whole human race. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, whether whatever generation you lived in, everybody shares the same story. What is that story? We've been created by God in his image. But through sin and the fall, uh, we've experienced the ravages of what sin does to our lives, okay? If that's the only story we know, it ends tragically. And there are people all around us out there that don't know the second story or the third story. All the story they know is the first story. And without knowing the third story, the second and third, it's a tragic ending, okay? And we know people like that everywhere. So the first story is the first point. The second story is his story. It's God's story. It's what he has done rec- to bring reconciliation to, you know, through Christ to reconcile us to the Father, okay? And the cross and all of that. So that's the second story. It's a, it's a, so whereas the one ends in tragedy, the next end, it begins with hope, Okay, God's got a way to lead us out of this. The second story is all about that. But some people confuse the second story with the third story. They think the second story is all, I just need to, to understand that and believe that and everything's good. The third story is, let's say it to you, your story. Has God's story now come in? Have I embraced what the gospel is? Have I come to the place where he is able to, to rewrite my story now? It's a redemptive story. And so, and this is, this is where we get to come to the, to the point of, of offering people that opportunity because a lot of people will be left with, you know, thinking, well, I've, I've known that Jesus died on the cross forever and yet my, my life still sucks doesn't it? Because there's a difference between just giving mental assent to some things and and being willing to embrace, okay? That's where repentance and faith and trust and and I want to be in Christ. It's not just Christ for me, it's Christ in me, okay? And that's where we're going with this story. The, The last thing I'll say on that is that we hope on that Sunday to promote 
a two to three week series that will inspire them to want to come back because we're going to go into a direction that, that should help them in that, in that stage. So, so it, this, there's a little bit of strategy in this is all I'm saying. So here's what we want to do. We got some people that are going to come up and take these, these uh, four baskets and they have four cards wrapped in a rubber band. And on the one side, it's talking about what you're invited to. And um, so, do, uh, do, you, do you have the four that are coming up? Okay, here comes Dan. Yeah, okay. Doug, yeah. Whoever wants to come up here. And we're going to take one down here, one down here, one down here, and one over here. What do we want to do with these four cards? We're going to pray over it in just a second. So, um, oh, thank you. Let me tell you what we, are, we should not do with these cards, okay? Please don't just give the card, stick the card on somebody's random house or mailbox or anything, okay? What should we do with these? What are these for? These are to be intentional. Who do, they, who do we want to give them to? A family member, a friend, or an associate, Okay, so what do we want to be able to, to, to do? You, we want to pray about these. We want to ask God, who can I, okay, I want to make sure you're hearing me, who can I intentionally reach out to? And I'm going to invite them. I'm going to be praying for them. I'm going to follow up and say, hey, uh, Come with us. We're going to go to. We're going to have special dinner afterwards. Or if they're a young family with kids, hey, you should come to the Easter egg hunt, the big Easter egg hunt that we have out here on Wednesday night. God forbid that He would use Easter eggs to lead anybody. To but it does have a pagan beginning. But I think, as far as I'm concerned, it's baptized now because we don't worship any of that stuff. Uh, just the fun, fun elements of it. Okay, so. Let's stand, if everybody's got one. You excited? Ready to be an ambassador? Yeah. Me too. It's been a while. This is, this is where the Lord's, Lord's leading us next, okay? So, I want to take a minute. We're, we're going to be here one minute longer. I want you to bow your head, and I want you to pray and ask God your own prayer to guide you and direct you to who you can give four cards to this week. And you got to give them out this week because next Sunday you're going to get four more. Okay? So we'll see how God works in that. So you got one minute. Just, just pray and ask God to lead you this week who to give these four cards to.